another out and about video this morning and today we are starting in Torre del Mar right next to the famous Faro the lighthouse in fact I'm actually gonna go round and round about to show you it again here we go if I go slow enough you should be able to see the lighthouse there there we go that is the lighthouse of Torre del Mar. This morning it's June and we've just been in a, a very early meeting. Uh, heading back to the office now for nine o'clock. Uh, we have been talking about EU residency, which normally we talk we talk an awful lot about the non to visa. But let's remember that uh, people as EU citizens are still coming to register here in Spain. Uh, the principles being so if you have an EU passport and you intend to come and live here in Spain uh, you'll need to register here as a resident who lives here um, the difference between a third country national who has a non-EU passport and someone who is an EU citizen is that as we know an EU citizen had, already has the right to come into the country and stay in the country they just have to register if they intend to spend more than 90 days and that registration includes having proof of access to healthcare, funds to support yourself and somewhere to live. That's the basics. Okay, across the different provinces they have different interpretations on how they'd like you to present, present that registration. You have to present it at your local uh, Extranjería National Police Office. Um, along with an EXA team and a tax which is called a Modelo 012 I think it's the 012 that we're looking at uh, EU family members well you can come in off the back of your if you're a descendant or a spouse of an EU citizen you can uh, come in off the back of that person uh, right off their status but you have to apply to the immigration office first for approval so as we know all third country nationals need approval permission so if you come in on an NLV for example your permission is the visa they put in your passport you then register that visa once you're here if you're a EU family member <coughs> then your permission it's granted in Spain, so you can enter Spain on a tourist visa and then apply from here. So there you go, I'm trying to straighten on that camera a bit really, see what we're doing there, it's better. So yeah, that's a, a, a brief discussion of what we've been talking about today, uh, this morning with a client of ours, EU citizen, spouse and a descendant. Now, uh, one thing that is very important is when they, when you, when you do an EU family members application, you have to remember that they do focus on the EU citizen. So uh, they focus on what the EU citizen has, money, money wise, how they're going to support their family here in Spain. Which, in some circumstances, uh, for example, if uh, Imagine it's a, uh, a married couple and one of them looks after the children the other one works. If the person who looks after the children is the EU family member uh, and the person who works is a non-EU and provides all the income and the funds, then sometimes it can be extremely difficult to get the residency because it's not the EU person who is earning the money. Uh, in that case you can use savings, uh, always best if savings are in a Spanish bank when you're applying for anything at immigration, whether it's, uh, if you're going to be using savings through experience, not in my opinion, through experience, if it's funds in a Spanish bank you can get a lovely Spanish bank certificate, a lovely stamp on that which they love to see and, uh, and that's it, job done. Whereas if you've got funds abroad, you have to get translations, they're not always accepted, so uh, so yeah, 
that's for NLV renewals, are you family members, is there anything that you're doing when applying within Spain <coughs> to immigration, I always think it's better to have the funds in Spain. Okay, so now we've uh, we left Torre del Mar and we're on the way to Malaga and then to Alarín de la Torre. Here, on, I don't know if you can't see that, on, on the left is actually a banana plantation, believe it or not. Now, this road here is the, the N340, probably one of the oldest coast roads in Spain. I could have gone through town straight onto the motorway, but I wanted to bring you through this town called Almayadi. Almayadi, which is part of... I believe it's like Torre del Mar, they both belong to Belez Malaga. Uh, so Belez Malaga is the main town, and these are like districts of the main town on the coast. Almayat is fantastic. Um, it is literally the, one of the virgin beaches uh, in, in, in Malaga. I think it's the only one that's left. When I say virgin beach, I mean it hasn't got a, uh, a, a boardwalk, it hasn't got what we call a paseo maritimo. Um, you have to drive down a really rough road to get there and very little tourism. There's a campsite here, uh, there's actually a nudist campsite a bit further, we just passed it there as well if that's your thing. Uh, so you've got two campsites, one a bit fresher than the other. And. Uh, we used to come here fishing actually, a friend of mine's got a place on the beach here, like we used to call it the shack, so it's called the hippie shack, it's literally just like an old house, single story, three bedrooms, no patio, but three three minutes from the beach, and uh, we used to come over when the kids were younger and have a couple of nights and go fishing in the evening. It was actually... Um, Almayati was used in a Netflix series to represent Torre Molinos in the 70s, believe it or not. Because um, it's still like it's in the 70s, basically. Uh, there's a Netflix series, it's a Spanish series, you can watch it dubbed in English, but it's predominantly Spanish language, called Brigada Costa del Sol, which I think in English it was called the Drug Squad Costa del Sol. And it was all about the uh, trafficking and stuff in the 70s, how, how it started in Torre Molinos, and Torre Molinos was sort of the centre, the hub for, you know, the, the, back in those days, the Hotel Peth Espada uh, was where people like um, Bridget Bordeaux, Sinatra visited in the 60s, and, you know, from there, Torre Molinos got its fame and became uh, a party place and a place where people would visit. And evidently with that came the start of the uh, the uh, the drugs coming over from Morocco and the series. It's eight 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 pro eight um, programs, I think it was in the series. And uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah pretty good. Oh, we've got a police stop here. That's interesting. We got. Uh, oh, we're going to get out breathalysed. <clears throat> well, I'm not allowed to record police. I'm going to stop. Well, we're back. Look at that. That was interesting, wasn't it? So, yeah, you're not allowed to record police, um, evidently, or take photos of police cars and stuff, um, especially when they're working. So we had to stop. Um, yeah, so because at the moment there's actually a festival going on uh, in Torre del Mar, the town where I've just left. I'm just trying to straighten up the camera. There we go. Um, so they've got breathalyzing checks along the road there. They don't, they, to be honest, they didn't ask me for a driving license, didn't even ask me my name. They just said, right, blow into this, and uh, comes up, all good, see you later. So there we go. Um, but yeah, you're definitely not allowed to record police. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, so carried on, after our little breathalyzing adventure. 
and what were we saying? We're gonna now we're gonna head towards the uh, motorway. Yeah, so drug squad, drug squad crossed out salt. Uh, if you get to watch it, it's very badly dubbed. It's unfortunate. If you watch it in Spanish, it's fantastic. It's so well done. But if you don't understand Spanish, then you've got to watch it in English. It's still okay, but um, it's not as good as uh, not as good a series as uh, as it is originally. But it really, they really, really nail the wardrobe. They nail they nail everything. It's really, really good. Very interesting. Um, and the um, the cars in it from the 70s, they, they did well, so there you go. <clears throat> so now we're heading to the main road. That was the traffic police, that was a Guardia Civil. Remember we have a number of police forces here in Spain. <coughs> Excuse me. We have the, uh, let's start with the local police. The local police are essentially run by the town hall. Um, many would say they're just a step up from traffic wardens that's a lie they're not they're a lot more than that but they do uh, a lot of the local traffic incidences in towns um, they're play they're not paid by the state I don't think I think they're paid by the local municipality so they're funded by them and they're known as Policia Local so they generally go in white and blue they won't wear anything that's green now we then have the um, Guardia Civil, which is the uh, civil guard, the, uh, uh, the the guys who basically, when uh, something a bit more serious happens, then the uh, the, uh, the local police call them in and say, "We, this, this is over to you, lads." Um, that was the Guardia Civil traffic division there. All right, so those guys there, um, if you can see, they had a couple of cars on the other side, which were the fast cars, and then the van that that guy was working out of, just doing the breathalyzing. Um, they had a van pulled over to the right there, so what generally happens, from what I've seen, is that if someone does get caught, then they move the vehicle off to one side, they'll remove you, obviously, from the vehicle, and then they'll, they'll get a, um, if there's no one to drive the vehicle, then they'll get, um, a low loader to come and pick it up and take it off. And depending on the gravity of the offence, you may be arrested. So. One thing that's very, very important is that you always cooperate. Okay, evidently in Spain the drink drive limit is a lot lower than I, I, I couldn't. I don't have a comparable to the UK, but. Um, I know it's very, very low, um, but the penalties start lower as well, so you can actually start with a fine, uh, you know, moving all the way up to jail time, depending on how much alcohol is in your bloodstream, so, yeah, um, you should never, ever, evidently drink and drive, it's not something that anybody should do, but if you have done and you get stopped by the police, you need to cooperate because not cooperating with the police here is extremely serious. So, uh, once know of a case of somebody who had two Kenyas, which are like small beers, um, which again, you shouldn't have, but they did at lunch, they got stopped by the police, and didn't cooperate, wouldn't blow into the, the, uh, the machine. Um, because they thought that they might get taken off to the police station by then the alcohol level would have dropped which I don't think they'd have been over anyway but um, that's just an offence that's straight away an offence uh, quite a serious one it's taken straight to court for that um, and then obviously if you're on a visa for any sort of third country national residency it could jeopardise that residency or the renewal when you come to renew it you can't renew a criminal record so uh, there we go, always cooperate with the police. So anyway, we had the, so we've got the Policia Local, and they've got Malaga 25 kilometers we've got, then we've got the Guardia Civil, and then we've got the National Police. So the National Police, they're the heavies, they're the guys that are in charge of the frontiers, so when you go and do all your uh, paperwork, they're the ones which uh, sign off at the extranjerias as such, but they're also the people who, who do all the heavy jobs, um, all the investigators, yeah, 
CSIs, and they have obviously uh, guys on the ground as well. Uh, so the national police are up there investigating all the uh, all the serious crime. So this road here, leaving Torre del Mar, what a fantastic little town Torre del Mar is. It's, you wouldn't, it's not really on the map, but it has some of the biggest events in the summer. So it has the weekend beach festival, which on the Saturday night attracts 40,000 people. Incredible. Then, um, well, according to some of the promotion that I've seen, whether it's true or not, I don't know. I didn't stand there counting. Um, and also has an air show, the Torre del Mar air show. It's fabulous, it's over, it's over the beach. So it's essentially free, you don't have to pay to get in, as long as you can find parking. And if you come to the air show, you'll find that people will just <coughs> rock up with the, with the coolers and uh, sit on the beach. It reminds me of when I was a, when I was a kid and living in the UK, we used to go to Duxford or Mildenhall air shows, you know, you're really there with the coolers. You know, sat there with the beers and watching the planes. That's what it's like here. It's brilliant. It's definitely worth a, uh, a watch. And if you are going to um, come to the air show and you are staying, you want to try and stay the west of Torre del Mar, uh, preferably close to the beach, because a lot of the planes come from Malaga Airport when they're doing the show. There's also uh, an aerodrome in Beleth as well, but a lot of the biggies would come from Malaga Airport, fly along the coast, do their show, and then go back again. So if you're lucky enough to stay on the coast, um, then you can see them flying over as well. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, just going past a place called Makarabiaia. Makarabiaia. That's difficult to say, isn't it? Chilches. Chilches is in a place. That's easy enough to say. It's very nice. I want to stay there with my parents. Small village on the beach. Makarabiaia. Makarabiaia. Macharabiaia. Wow. There you go. Look that up on Google and practice your Spanish. I have no clue about that place. I'm going to visit it though just for having the most weirdest, complicated name. Chilichis Bila Jarafi, which is this turn off here. Great little sea seaside towns there. The beaches are very clean here. So we are east of Malaga now, west of Torre del Mar. So between Torre del Mar and Malaga. I love this little area here. This is the east Costa del Sol. It's fantastic. <clears throat> A lot of people used to think that Malaga was just arrive at the airport and turn, turn right <laughs> but it's not there's so much to be seen this side as well It's this part, you have to be very careful. There's a speed camera here, speed trap. I did warn you back there, but crazy speed traps along here to see everybody slamming on. Here on the right hand side, you'll see there's a, that grey box that's actually a camera, 80 kilometers an hour. And what we, <clears throat> we found out the other day in, um, I was in my networking group, my business first. Fantastic group, just to network, nice breakfast. Um, 
it's quite nice to get out of the office actually and speak to people who are doing business as well in Boston our soul just to know what they're experiencing and, and stuff um, so yeah we were there and there's always some news read out there and um, the Pegasus camera Pegasus is actually the name of the camera on the helicopter so the traffic authorities that we know here are called the DGT, so the Dirección General de Tráfico. Here in Malaga, they actually have two helicopters which are equipped with the Pegasus camera. Now, the Pegasus camera can catch you speeding for more than a kilometre away. So, you have to be really careful. Here in Malaga, I think I've said it on other videos, just to stoke, there's no point in speeding. If you nip in, there used to be nip about, do this, do that now, it's just, <clears throat> you can't, you can't nip about. You should never speed anyway, obviously, but it's not worth it now. Uh, just have to be really careful. And obviously in the urban areas as well, they've lowered the speed limit. I'm not going to lie, the, some of the urban driving is, it's impossible because it's 30 kilometres an hour. It's, uh, it's one road coming back from the middle of town in Adrien de la Torre, which is downhill and it's 30 kilometers an hour. And you can't get down it in gear because you stall all the time. You have to just literally put it in neutral, roll down the hill with, the feet, with your foot on the brake <laughs> to keep to the speed limit. With people beeping at you because if you do the speed review, it's so slow. People behind you are very frustrating. When you speak to any British person or any expat, you say you say the Cala, everybody would think of La Cala de Mijas. I think it's very popular with, with foreign communities. If you say La Cala to any Spaniard or any Malagueño, somebody from Malaga, they would think of this Cala here, the Cala de Moral, because they're more accustomed to calling this the Cala than the Cala of uh, La Cala de Mijas. So there you go. Uh, Totalan, that's, a, that's an inland town. Uh, sadly, very famous now because a, a poor infant fell down a well there and died a couple of years ago just after lockdown. And uh, they spent two days trying to get, get him out, but um, eventually they found him. He, he passed, unfortunately. And this is um, close to a town called Rincon de la Victoria, so Victoria's Corner. Again, another nice town. It's, uh, I've done the half marathon there actually a couple of times. One of the times I think I came absolute last on this half marathon. Now, I'm not the fastest runner nowadays. Well, I never was, but I was a lot faster than I am now. Uh, it's just a fun runner, really. And, um, I turned up for this half marathon in Rincón de la Victoria and they're very, very, very fast here. You don't get fun runners, they're all club runners. So, um, generally, half marathon, you only get about two hours and 20 minutes before they cut it off. That's it, you know, to, to run it. So, you know, you, you've got to get in, which you should be able to, any, you know, you should be able to get in within two hours and 20 minutes. Um, but on this particular day, I'd actually, believe it or not, been out with some family the evening before and I'd got the, I'd got the dates wrong and I'd already booked the race and I knew we were going out for an evening the night before and I thought, oh, do you know what, I'm going to get up and do it anyway. So I got up and I'm not going to lie, we did have a couple of pints the night before so you know, I got, I'm not feeling great but got my running gear on and came down here on my own. 
that when I turned up to the race, it turns out that the biggest half marathon in Andalusia, one of the biggest, is the Cordova half marathon, which meant that most people were at the Cordova half marathon, and there's only a group of like 150 club runners turned up for the Rincon half marathon and me. And I wasn't even feeling that great, so uh, yeah, so I did it, but literally the gun went off, and literally from the moment the gun went off, I was on my own. Everybody was just charging off. And I was like, oh, here we go. It was a very painful 21 kilometers, I can tell you. Um, and I think I came dead last. I don't think there was anybody behind me. In fact, they were sort of packing up because the cutoff time was two and a half hours. I think the guy, before me was like 1.55 and it was me 20 minutes later so they were like sort of packing up and the poor water people on the last station you know clapping me with this sort of face of pity like it was like my first time they're like 60 races but they were clapping me like oh, this poor guy you know it's like no no so yeah there you go that's my running story for the half marathon in Rincon a little bit embarrassing but I got the medal anyway. The last. Should have given me a spoon. So now we're coming past El Palo. El Palo, now this is a district of the centre of Malaga. El Palo's fantastic. Now if you I, mean, I say fantastic about everywhere though, don't I? So, you know, visit and, and I just love living in Malaga. That's you know <clears throat> it's a it's a great place to live and work. Um, but El Palo is, so it's Far East District of Malaga Centre really, um, they were, I'm not too sure, I think it is actually under the Malaga Town Hall, if I remember correctly. If anybody knows different, then please put that on the comments below. Um, now El Palo is, it's like a barrio, it's like a typical Spanish sort of, um, uh, area but it has a beach and some fantastic fish restaurants on it as well you can generally get the fish uh, done over the olive wood very quite cheaply a lot cheaper than you would do in tourist areas um, but in particular there's a restaurant there called El Tintero which is it's it's famous it's been all over the TV um, lots of people go there and what they do at this restaurant is instead of you order you don't order from the menu basically they have about 15 waiters that they cook food up and then they plate it all up and then basically you the waiters walk around shouting what they're holding and if you want it you just stick your hands up and go yeah 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 bring that over and then at the end they just count up your plates and that's it so there's a, there used to be three types, I haven't been for years, there used to be three types of plates. There's a small one, a medium and a large one. So, and all of them had the same price. A fantastic atmosphere. Now if you're going for a quite romantic lunch, you really don't want to go there. But if you want to go and get a real hustle bustle market feel, you know, eat some great fish and be by the beach and that's really where you need to go so El Tintero if I remember I'll put the link below remember that taxi in front I'm not too sure if you can see it on the video but you'll see that the taxi has a blue number plate um, all public I'm not too sure now if it's now obligatory for them to have the blue number plates I think there was a period where they they could switch it or not so anyway let me explain because of all because of all fake 
taxis at airports and you know and, and stuff like that all public service vehicles ubers taxis stuff like that all have to have the blue number plates it's a blue bracket black background sorry with white white letters or what numbers on it <coughs> you can only have that if you're a public service vehicle it carries passengers so, um, because there was a lot of um, a lot of illegal taxis, people who were giving, you know, uh, pretending to give rides to friends to the airport in eight seaters, but every day they'd have, they'd have an awful lot of friends because every day they were there or something else. And they've sort of they tried to combat that with these blue with these blue number plates. So if you weren't registered, you wouldn't get them, and the police can identify that you're uh, you're actually working illegally. Um, <coughs> Now, I know there was a period in which taxi drivers had to switch the plates around. But I don't know if it's I don't know if it's obligatory yet, but I know obviously it's advisable. Maybe it is. We'll have to check that. But yeah, so blue number plates. If you're getting in a in a taxi, you see it's got blue number plates. Well, you know that it's registered because you can't get the blue number plates without being a registered taxi. And they are very strict about the production of number plates here. You have to go to a spares place which is authorised to actually make the number plates. So you have to present their documentation for the owner of the vehicle, everything that we know this with Upstick's Drive, and also the, the, uh, the paperwork for the vehicle as well. Taxi, did you all see that? To be fair, this lorry should be in the right hand lane. Oh no, it shouldn't. No, I'm lying. I'm very sorry. No, because that takes you off to Granada. It's in the right lane. I'm too sure I want to sit behind him though. Who knows what could fall out of that? So yeah, now we're on the main ring road, uh, circumnavigating Malaga <coughs> city. But you can tell, look, I mean, driving in Spain is a pleasure most of the time. Um, this is rush hour. <laughs> you know, it's busy, but it's not that busy. You know, half eight. It's half eight in the morning on the on the uh, on the Malaga ring road. It is summer, so a lot of people are starting earlier now. The summer hours, a lot of offices start at eight. Some of the garages start at seven, actually, so then do till two or three, and then knock off, because it just gets too warm. This year, up sticks, we're doing nine till three in the office. Yeah, Emily, but behind the scenes, there's an awful lot of <laughs> hours happen, you know, from home on the laptop still, we're still, still working, but, um, we try and stick to nine till three in the office because it just gets too hot otherwise. And our air, air conditioning has been limited now due to the government uh, ruling to save energy. So, but what's that? What's that's done is just means it really leaves the office early, goes home, and it puts the air conditioning on at home. So I think it's counterproductive to be honest. But 25 we're limited to, which if it's 40 outside, 25 is. Uh, it's, it's relative when you walk in, but it's it could do it being a couple of degrees lower than that, to be honest. And now what we've done is we have gone on to the main road which is circumnavigate so we so that road there was like the, the old ring road if we'd have gone right we'd have headed into the old a7 into malaga into the center um but here we are heading on the 
could almost call it a bypass, I would say. Sort of good old bypass that was built, which completely skips the whole of Malaga, skips Malaga Airport, and this bypass will drop you basically uh, Torre Molinos. See the various exit that's taking to Cordoba, Granada, Sevilla. The AP46, you have to pay on that road. Uh, if we carry on here, you can see you can get to Algeciras, Torre Molinos. So, in order to be Torre Molinos, then there's that uh, video I did where I went from Torre Molinos to La Cala. After that, you've got Maravilla, Estepona, all the way down to Cadiz. If you st stayed on this road going straight, you would end up more or less in Cadiz. 300 kilometers away from here. I'll also take you to um, the industrial site which is Campillos, over by Campillos, big karting track there as well, paintballing as well, a lot of activity that goes on there. Um, I'm not too sure if that's related, I've almost been paintballing there, but I'm not too sure if that's related to um, <clears throat> the fact that it's quite an industrial area as well, so they do a lot of activities and people who work there. Um, this cuts off, probably cuts off 25 minutes of a journey if you're to go the way through town. Well, through town, through the scene of Malaga. drops down, we come off a four laner from a downhill that drops to a hundred kilometers uh, an hour, that's really tough, and you're going into a downhill, um, so you have to watch your speed. Uh, as I say, the helicopter's out and about. Driving down here, you always get a fantastic view of the planes landing into Malaga Airport. If they're landing on runway 31, which is coming inland, uh, landing towards the sea, if they're, if they're landing the other way, then you'll see them taking off. Two runways, obviously, in Malaga now. Has been for a few years, I think now nearly 10 years, two runways. Which are both active in summer, you can see them both active, taking off and landing. One runway for taking off, one runway for landing. Depending on the wind, depends which one is. There was talk that they couldn't take off from the new runway towards the sea because there's a television tower there at the end of it. So they can only use that, that runway to land or take off in one direction. This is what I've heard. How true it is, I don't know now, but this is what I heard. I always thought, well, why would they build a runway if they knew there was a television area at the end of it? I wonder if anybody just thought about taking the aerial down. I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. Heineken factory off to our right there. A lot of industry in this area on the outskirts of Malaga. You, you, you fruit traders. You haven't seen it. On my, on my left there's a hotel called Hotel Castillo. 
which is a castle hotel, but I'm not actually sure what that's all about because it's an industrial site. Yeah, that police car on the left, you might see the lights, so that's the national police there. They don't normally get involved in anything traffic unless there's a fatality. They may have to be on the scene. And now we're about a kilometre away from Alorin de la Torre in the office. So here we go. I think that was about <coughs> 37 minute drive. And if you've been watching the video, many thanks. You've got lots of positive um, thoughts about these types of videos yesterday. I was on the phone yesterday, Wednesday, my call day. I talked to people who are thinking of coming to Spain, maybe using our services. Uh, that's mainly only a Wednesday or a Monday for me. In between, obviously, we've got to work as well. So, and uh, when we're doing what we call these discovery calls, where I'm talking to people and seeing if it's, uh, if it's viable for them to move to Spain, if they want to use our services, it's a bit of a sales call as well, you know, we're speaking to people, we, we do run a business. So, you know, once we've, we've spoken to people, we then, uh, then run through what we offer. Um, but I was talking to some people who watch the channel who had booked a call and they were like, oh, I love the videos you're driving about. And I said, I always thought they'd be the worst videos, but people really seem to, seem to like them, which is great. Um, here, this is literally, they've literally just built this new slip road here. It's fantastic because there's me again with a fantastic, we're a fantastic mood this morning, aren't they? Everything's fantastic. But no, this slip road, we used to have so many, um, they call them here, retenciones. Retenciones are um, car jams when, when your cars aren't moving. Um, so you remember, there you go, Spanish lesson. lesson. Retenciones. If you're in a retención, you're in a car jam. I'm sure that's not the right way to say it. But this new road they've put in has just stopped it all. That's it, just instantly. A couple of, couple of uh, extra lane and the slip road, and you just, you know, straight in. This is peak hours. This is 20 to 9, and this road leads you to Cartama, to Alarín de, uh, de, de, de Grande. Churriana if you go the other way. And that's it. So here we are, Alarín de la Torre. Ready to start our day, nine o'clock, nine till three today in the office, and then uh, go home, lunch, maybe a little siesta, then probably back on the emails. But yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for watching the channel. Um, hopefully you enjoy you enjoy these little videos. I'm going to get some more out and about videos done while driving. And yeah, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe.